He started out as an accidental playwright, actually, because at that time he was running his mother's cosmetic business in New York, the Maison d'Esti, and he was dating an a actress of some renown at the time. He all, had a very continental air about him because he had been brought up so much in Europe. And one day he and this young actress had an argument, and she looked at him square in the eye, and she said, why do you think I go out with you? She said, you are a classic boor. You make a good appearance, but that's about all. She said, the only reason I'm going out with you, sir, is for the same reason that a scientist embraces a guinea pig. I just like to try my situations out on you to see how they'll turn out. She said, in fact, I'm writing a play. <laughs> He was horrified and angered that he said, you are writing a play? He said, Madam, if you can write a play, I can write a play. And what's more, my play will be better and it will run longer. And, that's, and then he sat down and wrote the third act of his first play, The Guinea Pig. And it came so easily, he thought, nothing to this racket. And then he had to, of course, get the first and second acts. <laughs> very, very, <coughs> very difficult. <clears throat> but that's how he became a playwright just to begin with. It was absolutely accidental. I think his thoughts on Hollywood changed over the years, of course. But when he first came, he came to do some writing for Universal on a film called The Invisible Man and kept his apartment in New York and thought of himself and rented a home, and a couple of different homes, actually. And he still felt as though he were a New Yorker for at least five years. He kept that apartment going, although he never, ever left and went there. He kept the apartment going for five years. And then he bought a home here, which, of course, makes a difference. It gives you a few roots. But the thing he most admired about, about Hollywood was that the only thing that mattered it wasn't your education, wasn't your family background, it wasn't who you knew, it was talent. And he thought that was a pretty remarkable thing anywhere. And that was one of the th things he found very, very vivifying about Hollywood. He was lucky enough to have written a script on spec called The Power and the Glory, instead of writing on Sally, which is a customary thing out here, so that he had plenty of time to hang about on the set of The Power and the Glory. And he noticed that the director had a chair, that if he just raised his hand, drinks were bought. If he wanted to tap a cigarette, an ashtray was pushed, put under it. And the director just sat on the little high stool, directed people, and had a very fine life. And Preston decided at that moment, this was the king. And he said he wished to be a prince of Hollywood also. And he went back and he wrote The Great McGinty, his intention was that he would write a good film and then allow it to be sold to a person who would then allow him to direct. Well, he peddled around Hollywood for seven years with his script. And everybody said, oh, it's a wonderful script, Preston, but who's interested in politics? And other people read, oh, wonderful script, Preston. And he said, but women aren't interested in politics. So it took him seven years to sell the script and get his deal, which was to also direct it. So Paramount went for the deal. And Preston said, look, I'll sell you the script for a dollar if you let me direct it. And Bill LeBaron, who was the head of the studio at the time, said, well, Preston, he said, it's a lousy job. You got to get up at 6 o'clock every morning. You have to be on the set, work with a bunch of idiots who have to recite other people's lines. He said, if you wish it, so be it. You've got a very good profession now. If I were you, I wouldn't change it. Preston said, I'd like to change it. And besides, he says, I'll do a good job for you. And LeBaron said, I know you will. However, the legal department saw, the, saw their deal, $1 for the script, and they said that didn't look quite legal. So they upped it to $10. When I was for directing, because he had already, in his, in his mind, directed the picture while he was writing it. 
And when he was writing, for instance, he would, he would live that part. Because he, uh, he, did, he did write a few things when we were together. And he would walk around and dictate the lines, and to which he was supposed to pay strict attention. Because I thought he you know, wanted me to help you know, just get the lines down. So when he would be walking around thinking, I had a book here. And I would look down, I would be reading. And when he looked and he said, well, what have you got there? And I said, I'm, a book. Not allowed to pay attention. <laughs> so I put the book and paid attention. But then as he started to, direct, to write this, uh, a scene, he would become each of the parts. So much so that were it a, a, a sad scene or some contemplative scene, tears would come to his eyes. And he would say it exactly the way you would hear it on the screen later. Betty Hutton once described it, that he said the line, and you had to say it precisely as he told you to say it. And it turns out that Charlie Chaplin worked the same way. Claire Bloom gave an interview, and she said it was very, very easy, as long as you did it precisely and exactly to every little turn of the head, to every modulation of the voice, and as, which is what Preston did. And one of the reviewers in Time magazine, and I've forgotten for what film, said Pres that Preston must be one of the great actors of the world because the people in his films were superb, whereas in other films they were merely mediocre. What he felt about his stock company was that these were people who were in his early films, which brought him success, and he felt he had a moral obligation to keep those people there and let them enjoy the ride too, were there to be a ride. But he felt that it was almost like a duty. And, and not that they weren't good, they were wonderful. But I do remember his much admiring Barbara Stanwyck because he said that she had what many women don't have and that she would be beautiful all of her life because she had an inner beauty and that no matter her age, that beauty would still be there. And also that she was an instinctive actress and took almost no direction, she needed none. So when not needed, of course, he didn't offer it. But that she had this, as I said, an instinct, and she knew just how a line should be read. And he much enjoyed working with her, and she was apparently great, great fun. He thought that Joel McRae was a very fine actor. Now, Joel McRae was directed, so that when you see him say the lines the way he says them, it's because that's how he was directed. And Joel McRae was very facile with it, didn't mind him being directed, in fact, preferred it that way. He never had an attitude that Sullivan did, you know, that comedy wasn't worth doing. But the reason he wrote Sullivan's Travels was because many of his friends who were comedy directors, like Leo McCary, were beginning to make pictures with a message. And his effort was to try to indirectly tell his fellow directors that preaching was for preachers and the film was about fun. And that was the instigus for uh, Sullivan's Travels. Trying to crash the movies or something? Something like that. I guess that's pretty hard to do. Huh? I guess so. I never got close enough to find out. Oh, sorry. Say, who's being sorry for who? Am I buying you the eggs or are you buying me the eggs? Oh, just like to repay you for them. All right, give me a letter of introduction to Lubitsch. I might be able to do that, too. Who's Lubitsch? Drink your coffee. Preston and Lubitsch, for instance, were very, very good friends. And his very first picture, The Great McGinty, he wanted to have a screen that said, dedicated to my friend, Ernst Lubitsch. And this, just, what is this nonsense about dedicating pictures? Forget it. So it never happened, but he loved his pictures, and of course, if you know, they were brilliant. But Lubitsch, of course, was not a writer, but he was a director who told, knew how to tell a story. And that's, of course, what the director does. He's the storyteller. His attitude after he lost his, I guess, his glory, you could call it, his glory days were were over. Of course, it takes a time for one to realize your glory days are over. And as he said once, when you're hot, he said, you never know exactly why. And when you're not, you still don't know exactly why. But he was never bitter about it at all. 
in what he said he had forgotten because he had had it for so long, a great run of luck because talent isn't all you need. And his luck had run out. He said, what you do, you wait for your luck to come back in. He had a restaurant called The Players at the time, uh, right up on Sunset Boulevard. And Howard Hughes was quite often there, of course, with one pretty girl or another. And under the law, the restaurant and the bars had to close at 2 o'clock. So what Howard would do would be hire himself the band to stay and quite often keep the restaurant open God knows how long. And Preston being a night person, it was fine with him. They got along very well. And he and Howard decided to, you know, form a picture company. Howard would provide the money. Preston would provide the talent. Preston would cut his salary down to almost nothing because he would also have an interest in the company. And the deal was that when either one of them should ever become dissatisfied, the contract was off. All it took was a phone call. And all it took to form the company was a handshake. However, it took the lawyer like a year to put all this stuff together. And Preston set to work making a picture, uh, The Sin of Harold Diddlebach, and another picture called Vendetta, which he had written, and he was writing, producing, directing, and running a studio. Howard Hughes apparently just wrote the checks because they went to the Hughes Tool Company and just they just wrote the checks or whatever th things came up. And then one day, about 5 in the morning, Preston got a phone call, and Vendetta was then underway I think there were 150 extras on the set. And Howard called up and said, Preston, I want to call it off. Preston said, OK, Howard. And that was the end of that. Now, Preston never knew it exactly because Howard never talked to him again. Not that he talked to him often during the filming. And, but during Vendetta, they were using horses in mean, part of the scenes. And so Preston said to the Wrangler, I'd like to ride the horse during lunch. How much would that cost? He said, how much would that cost? Mr. Sturgis, for you? So every, every lunchtime, Preston would ride this horse, you know, because they were out in the fields, had, had a good, and he was a good rider, and never thought another thing about it, because after all, Mr. Sturgis. Then years later, we were having dinner, and I cannot remember now with whom. And he had his own opinion on why the Hughes Sturgis ep company had, had split apart. And Preston, of course, was interested in hearing it. He said, he said Preston, he, he thought you were just throwing away his money. Preston said, well, why would he think that? He said, it was the horses. Preston's horses? He said, you, your personal use of the horses. He said, but that didn't cost anything. He said, oh, no. He said, that Wrangler charged, and he charged heavy for every single time you got on that horse, which, of course, is what Preston never knew, but it was pretty revealing. And Howard was, of course, a, as a rich man, they're always very careful with where the dozen money go. And, he, and to Howard, that was proof that Preston was just throwing it away. <laughs> 